Take your Bible this morning for our scripture reading, if you will, to 1 Timothy chapter 2, please. 1 Timothy chapter 2. <clears throat> We're going to read the first seven verses of 1 Timothy chapter 2. Read the verses responsibly as we normally do. Begin together on one, then alternating. I'll read verse 2 and alternating until we end together on verse 7 of 1 Timothy chapter 2. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing please to read God's word. And let's begin together on verse 1 of 1 Timothy chapter 2. Ready? I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all, to be testified in due time. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. And let's pray together. Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture here this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the Bible. Thank you, Lord, for preserving your words for us that we hold copies in our hands this morning. Lord, I don't, we do not believe that these are just the words of men or the words of a man. We believe them to be in truth, the words of God. And Lord, thank you already for the wonderful, wonderful music this morning. Uh, it stirred our heart. And Lord, I pray it's been a, a blessing to you as we've sung with grace in our hearts unto thee. I pray you'll bless the special now as it's brought to us. Help us to listen carefully and make our hearts ready to receive your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. In New York Harbor stands a lady with a torch raised to the sky and all who see her know she stands for liberty for you and me I'm so proud to be called an American, to be named with the brave and the free. I will honor our flag and our trust in God and the Statue of Liberty. Lonely Golgotha stood across with my Lord raised to the sky and all who kneel there live forever as all the saved can testify. Sin. So the cross liberates the soul. Oh, the cross is my statue of liberty. It was there that my soul 
was set free, unashamed I proclaim that a rugged cross is my statue of liberty. Amen. That's good. Our Father in heaven, we bow before you in prayer now as we come to the preaching of your word. Lord, we want to thank you for the cross of Jesus Christ by which our liberty from sin was purchased. Thank you, Lord, for loving us and for allowing us to live in this country. Lord, we've had the privilege to be in other countries of the world now. Lord, I... I know there's just no place like the United States of America. Lord, I pray that you will help us now this morning to focus on your word and the truth you have for us today. Help me to be clear and concise as I bring the truth today. Holy Spirit of God, do your work as we open up your word. Minister that word to the hearts of people in this room this morning. Meet the need of each and every individual here, please. May you be exalted, may Christ be lifted up, and may we be drawn closer to you because we were here this morning. And I pray, Lord, that we'd leave in a little bit knowing that we can impact our country for Jesus Christ. So use the message to that end, and I ask it in Jesus' name, amen. You know... When you're, a, when you're a child, you don't always think a lot about the 4th of July, except as a time that families got together and maybe had picnics, or in our family that meant a big family gathering and usually a softball game or something along those lines, and uh, fireworks later that evening, but I always looked forward to it because it was a big get-together not necessarily because of what it represented. I was just uh, looking forward to the day and the fun that it would be. As you get older, you begin to appreciate a little more what the day means and uh, what it actually means to have freedom. It's not just a chance to light fireworks, but it's a chance to thank God for our country. It's a chance to thank God for those who sacrificed that we could have a country like this and that God has given us a truly great country to live in. I don't know about you, but it's, it's hard for me sometimes to hear the songs we've been saying today without choking up a little bit. I just, uh, I, love, I love America. I'm glad I live here. But it's the love of my country and the love for God that makes it difficult to see some of the choices our country's made in the last 50 years. It's difficult to see our country go away from God and go away from the gospel and increase in, in their greed and increase in their immorality. We continue to try to find all the answers that, uh, that man searches for except the answers that God has. In His Word. We continue to justify our sin and think it's no big deal. But you understand, freedom, true freedom is found in boundaries. Freedom is not the freedom to do whatever you want. Freedom is the freedom to do what you ought to do. There are laws that have to be followed for freedom to work. If there's no laws and there's no boundaries, then we have chaos. It's, it's similar to when we're born. You know, nobody, nobody is free when you're born. You know why? We're born sinners. We're born with that sin nature. No matter how, no matter how sweet and innocent and delicate that little child is, they're a sinner. 
except for my grandchildren, of course. But <laughs> <laughs> oh, you don't have to teach them to be selfish. You don't have to teach them to, 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 to say, it's mine. Or to, or to try to be deceptive. That's, that's already in their heart. You and I, you know what? We, we don't have a choice. Well, our choice is we sin. We're born sinners. And man, uh, listen, we don't, we don't go towards God. We run away from God. God comes after us. He pursues us. And of course, 4th of July is not just freedom for America. As Bob sang just a minute ago, it ought to remind us of freedom for the Christian. And freedom for the Christian was obtained at the cross when Jesus Christ paid our sin debt. Not only can that free us from the penalty of sin, which is death and hell, but it frees us from the power of sin as well. That sin doesn't have to have dominion over us anymore. We are free from the power of sin in our life. Now we have a choice. Because only Christ can give us freedom. The Bible says, Jesus said, if the Son will make you free, you'll be free indeed. That's true freedom. So I'm thankful for the country we have to live in. I'm thankful that I can get in my car and drive not even a half mile and go to a store and get anything I want. Buy anything that I need. I'm thankful for the freedom we have in speech and the freedom we have to gather together like we are this morning. I'm thankful that I can step back as a Christian in our country and, and I can see things through the lens of God's Word. I can see our country the way God would have us to view it and to see it. I see the corruption. I see us going away from God. I see us uh, turning our back on the one whom the, who really we look to in the founding of our country. You understand when the first president was elected in our country, George Washington, what proceeded after that was about a, a, about a two-hour church service in Congress where the Bible was read and it was preached and there was prayer. One of the first acts of the Congress was they voted to give every U.S. citizen a Bible. They passed out Bibles to the U.S. citizens. Can you imagine? Wow. And our job, I think now, as believers, as Bob's saying, that our freedom in Christ, our, our deliverance from being a slave to sin, our job is to let the country know, let the rest of our country know, our world that we live in, our neighborhoods where we live and work, that there's freedom in Jesus Christ. You don't have to be a slave to sin. You don't have to be a slave to wrongdoing. And sometimes I know we look at the country and it's a big country. You don't, you don't fly out to... to Minnesota or Wisconsin or, or uh, Nebraska <laughs> or some of the places where you've been out to California or Colorado or some of the other states we mentioned but realize this is a huge country. And you, sometimes you think, what, what, am I, what can I do? You know, well, you don't have to get very far up in the air where, you know, you don't, you don't see anything but clouds and as you come in for a landing, even on an airplane, man, they're just little, the houses are little specks, let alone people. You think, what, what am I going to do? What, is, what does God expect me to do? What does God expect you to do to try to bring our country back to God? To get our perspective back to Him. I'm not saying everybody's going to be an independent, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptist, though I think they'd be better if they were. I'm not saying that that's the, that's the goal, but let's acknowledge Him. 
Let's just acknowledge Him. There's a day in the country where not everybody went to church and not everybody was a, was a, a godly Christian, but everyone had a fear of God. And, and we don't have that. What are we supposed to do? Well, I believe God gives us some things here in 1 Timothy chapter 2. And, and you understand, the, as Paul talks to Timothy here, you say, well, they had an easier time than we did. <laughs> you don't know much about history. You don't know much about the, the, the government they were under who persecuted Christians, would burn them at the stake and feed them to lions for entertainment. But here in 1 Timothy 2, and just briefly this morning, I want to give you three tools that God gives us to impact our nation for Him. That, that will help maybe our country to look back to God instead of looking away from God and looking to sin. Notice 1 Timothy chapter 2. Paul said, I exhort therefore that... What's the next three words, church? First of all. First of all. So there's some matter of importance here. Or he wouldn't have said first of all. So there has to be some priority here. And he says, first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority. I said, uh, the first thing, the first priority is to pray faithfully. Pray faithfully. That's why the choir, the choir sang that song this morning. Prayer. How do you remember going to school in America and in your classroom there was prayer in the morning before you started school? Yeah, look at that. Someone related this recently. A teacher went into her classroom about 15 minutes before class and caught a bunch of boys in a huddle on their knees in the corner of the room. She asked what they were doing and one of them shouted back, we're playing poker. And she said, oh, that's okay. I was afraid you were praying. That's sad. That's where we've come. We see people huddle together to talk and people huddle together to roll dice or people huddle together to gamble. How often do you see people huddle together to pray? Prayer is the first priority. Jesus said, uh, all men ought to say of my house, my house will be called a house of prayer. Yet how many, how many churches, uh, is there very little prayer that goes on? Very little. Uh, that, that would not be the characteristic. That would not be the first of all that you would think about. First of all, pray. Not criticize. Not, not post on social media. Pray. Pray. Samuel Chadwick said, the one concern of the devil is to keep Christians from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, and prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil, he mocks at our wisdom, but he trembles when we pray. Ian e. Bounds, who wrote many books on prayer, said what the church needs today, and by the way, he wrote this in the 1800s. He said what the church needs today is not, is not machinery are better, not new organizations are more and new novel methods, but men and women whom the Holy Spirit can use Men and women mighty in prayer. The Holy Spirit does not flow through methods, but through men and women of prayer. The best thing you and I can do for our country and for our leadership in our country is to get down on our knees, get alone with God and pray for our country. And pray for our leaders. It is, it is our nature and it's, it's, it's our old nature that makes it so easy to just be critical. 
There are, there are leaders in our country that, that, that I don't like. I don't care for them. I don't care for what they stand for. I don't care for what they believe. I don't, I don't like it when they even open their mouth and speak. That's me. But that doesn't relieve me of my obligation to pray for them. There's still a soul for whom Christ died. And I'm commanded to pray faithfully for them. First of all. First of all. Praying for our country. Praying for our church. Praying for our brothers and sisters. Praying for our sons and our daughters. Praying for the lost. Pray at home. Pray at church. Pray when you get up in the morning. Pray when you go to bed at night. Pray. David said, evening and morning and at noon will I pray. Will I pray and cry aloud? If David, who was king of Israel and ruler over several million people, I suppose if he could find time to pray three times a day, you and I ought to be able to find one time a day to pray. How can we expect God to move in our country and to move in our churches and to move in our lives when we neglect to pray? Somebody says, well, Pastor, it's hard to pray. Yeah, the devil makes it that way. He makes it hard to pray, so you won't pray because he doesn't fear as long as we're doing what we do in our strength and in our power. I don't want to be in 2 Timothy where we, where we um, that might have been a radio broadcast, not a message, but um, where, where uh, the, the, the Paraks are going on vacation tomorrow. And uh, the whole world knows now it's on the internet. And, um, they, and they, they edit their daily radio broadcasts that we do. And so I had to get seven of those broadcasts done for them to take vacation. And, uh, but I'm, I'm not bitter. And uh, no, and uh, so I had all these messages going ahead. But you know, where where in the last days perilous times will come, and and it just gives all the description and says, the last description is they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. You know where the power comes from? The power comes when you get God involved in it, and you don't get God involved in it until we pray. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray. Now, why don't we pray? We don't humble ourselves. Pride doesn't pray. Pride says, I got this. I can do it. And when we get up and we go about our duties and we go do what we do and we don't take time to pray and seek God's help and seek God's blessing, we're telling God, I got this. I don't need you. It's pride. In spiritual warfare in Ephesians chapter 6 when it talks about the armor of God and taking unto us all the armor of God in Ephesians 6, 17 and 18 the Bible says take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit which is the Word of God praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Take all the armor on you, but then you better be praying always with all prayer and supplication. First Thessalonians, you know what it says? It says pray without ceasing. And it just means keep, keep that constant communication with God all the time. Cradle the phone. Used to have those phones that were attached to the wall. I know some of you don't know what that is. You young people, we have to, you have to draw a picture for you someday. You didn't take it with you. It stayed there. And guess what? When you went away, nobody called you. In fact, you didn't even know if anybody called you at home. What happened when you called somebody and it, the phone nobody was at their house? You know, and the phone just rang and rang and rang and rang. Until whatever the number was in your head, you decided, I guess no one's home, and you hung up. 
What'd you do? You called back later to see if somebody was home. But you know what you did when you got somebody on the phone and you were talking and maybe for a, a, a wife or a mother it was dinner time and it's time to get dinner ready. You know what you did? You put that phone up here and you cradled it right there and you went ahead and did your job and you walked around and you just kept it with you. And my friend, God is saying here when you pray, don't get up in the morning and say, okay, I got my prayer time and then get up and walk away and not talk to God again Do you go back to that place tomorrow. No, get God on the line and then cradle the phone with you all day long. And everything that goes about, talk to Him. He, he'll stay on the line. He, he, won't, he won't cut you off. God never drops a call. And, and He'll stay with you. Pray without ceasing, without stopping, without interruption. Most powerful thing God's given to us is prayer. And probably if I took a poll this morning and, and you, were, you were open and honest before God, and I say, what's the, the one area of your life, your Christian life, that you, would, you, you think you would struggle with the most or that you wish you could improve on, I almost guarantee you it would be prayer. Prayer. Men ought always to pray and not to faint, Jesus said. God is, God is so big. God is so powerful. God is so awesome and amazing. But He tells us that if we pray, He'll listen to us. That's amazing. It's amazing. You know, you, you think, well, I want to... Uh, we were talking the other night about the situation we've had at the prison. I mentioned it in Sunday school a little bit. You know, and... Yeah, let, let me, I'm going to talk to the director of the prisons, Gary Moore. Is he going to talk to me? You think if I called his office and said, uh, this is uh, Pastor Slaybaugh from Bible Baptist Church in Grove City. And I'm, I need to talk to Gary Moore right now. You think they're going to say, oh sure, just a moment, let me put you through. I doubt that would happen. And, and when... He's an he's a important guy in the state of Ohio. He's the director of all the prisons, corrections, in the cabinet of the governor of the state of Ohio. He wouldn't necessarily want to listen to me. But God does. God does. And God listens to you if you'll pray to Him, if you'll talk to Him. If, if, if we don't pray for our country, who is? Who's going to pray for our country? If we don't pray for God to intervene and we don't pray for God to help our leaders, who's praying for them? The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Do we believe that? Then shouldn't we practice that? Pray faithfully. The second thing, the second tool God says we should do is Notice verse number 2. We're praying for kings and for all their authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. The second thing God says you can do to help our country is to live godly. Live godly. You know, God desires that you and I be godly, holy people. People who live righteously. Whether, whether you're in public or whether you're in private. We have the privilege as believers to set the right example to the unbelievers of this world about how someone ought to live. 
I'm always amused at these videos I see at times. Usually it's on Facebook. And the other day I saw one where a guy's on a bicycle and he, he comes in front of the, a park bench where someone's sitting and he's, he's doing these jumps on this bicycle and a wad of money falls out of his pocket. And then he rides away. And people get up off the bench, Brother Dave, and they pick that money up and they, at first they'll go, hey, and of course he's gone. And then they got the camera on him and they look around. Stick it in their pocket. Stick it in here. See, and then, then they have someone walk up and say, somebody dropped the money. Somebody dropped the money. And how many people will say, what are you talking about? What would you do? How, how, how honest would you be? Do you live a life in all godliness and honesty? Uh, hello? Yeah, I won't make work today. Yeah, I'm not feeling very good. Yeah, I, I hope I'll be okay by tomorrow. Okay. Okay, what do you want to do today? I got the day off. Godliness and honesty? Do we live righteously? We have the privilege of living right. We have the, the honor of living godly in this world. Someone said, Patrick Henry shouted, give me liberty or give me death. The next generation shouted, give me liberty. And the present generation just shouts, give me. Give me. The Tocqueville of France who came to find the greatness of America made the conclusion that America is great because she's good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. That's the day in which we're living. But you understand... America can't be great. What de Tocqueville saw was America's churches. That's where he saw America's greatness. If the churches are not godly, America can't be godly. And the churches can't be godly if we're not godly. Made up of us. When, when there's no difference in the way the lost entertain themselves and we entertain ourselves. When there's no difference between what the lost person listens to and what we listen to. When there's no difference what the lost person watches and what we watch. And we're not living righteously. We're not living godly. Most of you know that that word godly or holy means to be set apart. You know what it means? It means we're different means we're not going to be like everybody else. The world always says, oh, be yourself, be yourself, but then everybody ends up being like everybody else. And when someone really does stand out, someone really does want to be different, and they really do want to please God, then you get ridiculed for that. You'll get even persecuted for that. To live holy means you look at every aspect of your life, what you watch, how you dress, how you think, how you act, every place you go. And you always ask yourself this question, will this bring glory to God? Or will this bring glory to me? Will this, will this please God? We were created for His pleasure. Will this be pleasing to God, what I'm about to do, what I'm about to watch, what I'm about to listen to, where I'm about to go, what I'm about to put on? Well, I'd be happy if Jesus saw me right now. i got news for you. He does. He does. To live righteously means I don't justify sin 
so I can keep practicing it. To live righteous means when I see sin and I know something's wrong, I must run away from it. You see, before I was saved, before salvation, had no power to run from temptation. had no power to run from sin. Now I do. Now I do. I'm a child of God. And I can't rely on just my willpower to do it. There's two, there's two things you rely on to resist temptation. Number one, you rely on the Word of God. When Jesus was tempted by Satan three times, all He did was He quoted Scripture back to Satan. Get your arm yourself with God's Word. And fight the temptation with the Word of God. Satan is powerless against the Word of God. God's Word is authoritative even to Satan. The second is the Spirit of God. The Bible says it's through the Spirit of God that I mortify or put to death the deeds of the flesh. Someone says, well, I just can't stop this, or I just can't quit this, or I just can't do that. No, you're right, you can't. But God has given us the Holy Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, who is also all-powerful. Omnipotent is the word. And what we're saying when I can't do it, we're saying, yeah, I, I am not relying on the Holy Spirit. I'm trying to do it myself. Because through the Spirit, I can put to death the deeds of the body. You see, we said this to the folks at RU Friday night, Jesus died on the cross. Jesus loved Himself and gave Himself for us not to make us a better us. He says, well, i got to be me. No. you got to be Him. You and I are not here to be a better me. We're here to be Him. Christ in you, the hope of glory. What is, what is the goal? To be conformed to the image of His Son. God's, God's wanting us to be like Christ. Not to be like me. It's not supposed to be about me. It's not supposed to be about you. It's supposed to be about Him. That Christ would be seen in us. We pray faithfully. We live godly. The third thing we do. Verse number 4. Who will have all men to be saved and come under the knowledge of the truth? We witness fervently. God desires all men to be saved. That kind of does away with the select few, doesn't it? God doesn't desire just the elect to be saved. He desires that all men be saved. He desires that all men come to the knowledge of the truth. That's why we can go and preach the gospel to every creature. You don't have to worry about, well, I'm talking to someone who God never chose to be saved. No, 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 no. That's not what the Bible teaches. The God says, I want everybody to be saved. I want everybody to know. Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know. Everybody ought to know who Jesus is. Let's tell everybody the gospel. Everyone ought to have an opportunity to accept Christ as their Savior. It ought to break our heart to look at that list on Wednesday night that has gone on now for four or five years of unreached people groups who some of those folks, the first time they're going to hear about Jesus Christ is when they're burning in hell. Shame on us. Shame on us. Leighton Ford was an associate of Billy Graham. And he said, he told this story, he said, I was speaking in an open air crusade in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Billy Graham was scheduled to start the crusade the next night and actually came in a day early. Leighton Ford said he came to um, the meeting 
where he was preaching and came incognito, Billy Graham did, put on a hat, baseball cap, wore a t-shirt and a pair of pants, dark glasses, and sat on the grass at the rear of the crowd. He said because he was wearing a dark hat and sunglasses, he said nobody really recognized him. But he said sitting right in front of Billy Graham was an elderly gentleman. And he seemed to be listening very intently. And Leighton Ford said, when I gave the invitation to have people come forward to get saved, Billy Graham tapped the man on the shoulder and asked if he'd like to accept Christ as his Savior. And the man said, I'm thinking about it. And Billy Graham said, well, you don't need to think about it. Let's go forward and have someone talk to you about it. And the man said, nah, I think I'll just wait till the big gun comes in tomorrow night not realizing he was talking to the big gun. But you know what? It's not about a big gun or a little gun (laughs) or hearing a certain person to give the gospel. It's about receiving Christ as your Savior. And it's about telling everybody about the Lord. You know, so many... I think would receive Christ if they ever if they ever heard the gospel explained to them. I don't know how many times I've asked people, has anyone ever taken a Bible and showed you how you can know for sure you're going to heaven when you die? And people say, no, no one's ever done that. No one's ever done that. Every Christian ought to know how to take your Bible and, and bring someone to faith in Jesus Christ. Every believer ought to know how to do that. And if you don't know how to do that, let's learn how to do that. You come talk to, to myself or talk to Dr. Yoder or talk to some of these men in the church, Brother Wallace, who, who can regularly win people to Christ and say, teach me how to do that. I want to be able to take my Bible and show someone how they can be saved. At Sunday school we talked about we can so speak so that they'll believe. Present Jesus Christ to them. Nobody gets a pass on that. When you stand before the Lord, you know, and Jesus says, uh, where are the souls that you've led to Christ for me? Where are the souls that you've brought to the Savior? And you say, well, God, I really wasn't real good at that. And you're looking at the nail scars in His hands and the scar in His side. And you're making excuses as to why you couldn't tell anybody else that Jesus died for them. When, thank the Lord, somebody told you. Nobody's exempt. Nobody gets a pass. The Bible says, how can they call on Him in whom they've not believed? How can they believe in Him of whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. We're in an incredible position to make an impact in people's eternity. We have, we have means and methods today that other generations have never had to get the gospel out. To spread the gospel to every creature. And shame on us if we do not get the gospel out. It's our responsibility to go into all the world and give the gospel to every creature. Are they all going to receive it? No. But it's our job to tell it. It's our job to take it. I mentioned in Sunday school that if I remember right, Brother Bob, I believe one of the inmates there has talked about all the, that he's been to like 20 some different groups that come into the prison, all the faith based groups, everybody. And they said, He said, You're the only group 
that gives the plan of salvation and offers men an opportunity to receive Christ as their Savior. Shame on us. Shame on folks who take the Word of God behind the bars and then don't offer the prisoners an opportunity to know Christ as their Savior. We have the path to freedom. We have the path to salvation. The path to forgiveness of sin. And not just from the penalty of sin and not going to hell, but how to live a better life now. How to live free from sin now. Not be in bondage to stubborn habits or addictions or things that keep us from being what God wants us to be. We have that answer in Jesus Christ. How do we keep it to ourselves? We have to heed Paul's words to Timothy. Pray faithfully, live godly, witness fervently. That means have an urgency about it. Why would I be urgent to tell somebody about Jesus? Because first of all, Jesus could come back. And it might be eternally too late for them. Jesus, one of these days when the preacher says Jesus could come today, we're going to hit it right. And He's going to come. But secondly, that person may die. You think those five people who went to work Friday morning? Was it Friday or Thursday? In Virginia? You think they, did you think it was ever in their wildest thought it would be the last day they lived? But five people went into eternity. I just saw a little headline this morning. I don't know, somewhere in Utah, somebody went with a knife and stabbed nine people. We don't know. You don't know. You don't know the restaurant you go to today. Someone might come through the doors and open fire. It'll be the last meal you eat. Nobody will go out to eat now. But you understand? That's why we better be fervent about this. We better have an urgency. I don't, I don't know. No one can boast themselves of tomorrow. We don't know what a day will bring forth. You know somebody who's lost right now? Do you know somebody who needs the gospel right now? You ought to be at the altar praying for them this morning. Asking God to save their soul. That they would see themselves as a sinner in need of a Savior. And that Jesus is the Savior they need. There's an old per Persian legend that pictures four angels watching God create the world. The first angel says, why did God make it? Another angel said, how did God make it? The third one said, can I have it? And the fourth one said, what can I do to make it better? Someone said the first, the first answer is a philosophical attitude. Why did God do that? The second is a scientific attitude. How did God do it? The third one's a selfish attitude. I, can I have it? The last one's the Christian attitude. What can I do to make it better? When I look at the United States of America, certainly not what she should be. But I don't want to have the wrong attitude about America. I don't just want to look at America and say, how did she get that way? And I don't want to just look at America and say, what can I get out of them? What can I get out of the country? Give me, like many are saying. I'd like to have the Christian perspective and look at my country and say, how can I make it better? How can I make my country better? Not, not make America great again. Let's make America godly again. That's our responsibility. Let's ask God to help us to do that this morning. Let's pray together. Shall we, Father, take the truth this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the instruction here that Paul gave to Timothy. 
And yet, Lord, it has helped us this morning in regards to our country that we live in and our responsibility as believers. And Lord, I'm asking you this morning that you would minister to our heart. First of all, Lord, if any in the room do not know you as their Savior, may they realize that they are not part of the solution, they're part of the problem. And they need to be saved. They need to accept Christ as their personal Savior. And Lord, those of us in the room who I believe would represent most in the room this morning would say, I know You as our Savior. Lord, we have a responsibility to pray faithfully for our country, for one another, for our leaders, for lost people, for our families. Help us to pray faithfully. Help us to live godly to show this world that there's a different way to live and we don't have to live as a slave to sin there's victory in Jesus Christ and help us to witness fervently with an urgency with a passion to tell others of Jesus Christ We want to make a difference. We want to help our country to turn to God once again.